Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast of a bunch of writers sitting around drinking tasty beverages and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are John Schmidt and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 116, interview with Christine Cianci. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are so glad to have you today. I mean, you and I have met once briefly years ago, although you don't remember me. I was just in awe of your art skill for a class you were teaching. But John and you have known each other sometime in the SCA. Is that correct? Probably longer than we want to admit. (laughs) Okay. How long has it been? I'm not going to admit that. And it doesn't matter because, and shouldn't this be episode CXVI in any case? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. This is definitely episode CXVI. You're here because you have written two books, but one just came out that is all about beautiful historic fantasy. And I want to talk about Walking the Mosaic. This is your first nonfiction. I mean, sorry, this is your first fiction. And tell us about it. You've written a book before that, right? Yes, I've written two books, actually. So The um, Roman Tarot was your first one. Right. And that uh, that was a companion book to the Roman Tarot deck that I created out of oil paintings that I did and um, created a tarot deck out of it. But it's also, you know, totally inspired by Roman symbology and history. Um, I kind of have a thing. About There's a delightful it. amount of symbolism to be had there, too. <laughs> Why Roman? What what? Is it just your last name, your heritage? Uh, Uh, I think it has a lot to do with my heritage. But um, since I was a little girl, actually, I was fascinated by Greek and Roman mythology. And I think that um, a lot of it comes from uh, a lot of my own fascination with Roman history comes from my childhood fascination with Roman and Greek mythology and how so much beauty and art and so much of our society our architecture, our literature, our belief systems, and at so much of Western, um, so much of Western history and uh, culture is is you know founded in that mythology, and um, it's always captivated me. You're a werewolf lover. You like the fact that we our culture has been mothered by a wolf. Yes, yes, I am a wolf lover too. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, what I find fascinating is actually not that you create the past, but that you create a future based on the past. And it is so vivid and so involved and so visual because you you have a wonderful description of things. And without revealing much of the story, except for that an understanding of art really enriches it. I, I just went to the a Pompeii exhibit and saw Roman mosaics. So when you talk about mosaics in the book, I immediately picture them. But can you give us some of the pieces of artwork just off, you know, without walking through chapter by chapter that inspired you? Or is it, are you so immersed in Rome that it just bubbles up from you? I think I'm a bubbler. Um, (laughs) I I have read so much Roman history. Um, I I can't quite read it in the original Latin, unfortunately, but I do read a little Latin. And that's why I use the the chapter titles as um, Latin words. And they're very basic Latin words. I didn't like get into declensions too much. I just use the, you know, the simplest form. (laughs) You know, the the artworks that are mentioned in the book are, uh, for the most part, made up, except for one, which has nothing to do with ancient Rome. And that's, I mentioned a Rothko painting um, in the book. And I mention Ribeiro in the book. Um, actually, that's, so that's not quite true. I do mention a, a Renaissance artist in the book, Ribeiro, who was a follower of Caravaggio. So you probably more, um, familiar with Caravaggio's work. And I describe a painting in the book that is uh, in real life, a painting of the adoration of the uh, adoration of the shepherds. But in the book, I change it to be uh, a pagan uh, inspired painting instead. So um, I like twisting things like that. (laughs) Well, as I say, I I love Rome too, in my own way, having 
took Latin and Rome Republic and Roman Empire and died loving Benvenuto Cellini's uh, autobiography where any it, there's the advantage if you're in a battle and you're the only one who writes about it, you single-handedly probably killed anybody that was of any import, which was just genius, I love. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but you set it forward in space. What tell us a little about the the alternative future that you envisioned for for this book? Um, so some of it's completely. Um, uh, I don't know what I, what word I would use to describe what I. So I, I so uh, I am kind of anti religionist in the book. Basically, one of the reasons why Rome has got to be. Uh, to a point where they can use FTL in the book is because they never had a dark ages. So what happens to a society when they are not um, held back from free floating ideas of science and everything else, and they can push forward without having to worry about um, dogmatic oppression. And so um, in this book, what I was kind of doing the what if scenario was what if there was no, what if there was no Christianity? What if Christianity never became the, the state religion of Rome? What if instead it was a stoic philosophy that, that took over and allowed people to question everything about their world? And in so doing, bringing forward the time when people would use a, a more scientific method way of looking at the world instead of the dogmatic way of looking at the world. And so that's kind of where I went with it and why I wanted to um, bring Rome forward into a place. Um, and other things that I brought forward along with that is in the ancient world, homosexuality and bisexuality weren't really that big of a deal, right? People, um, people, you know, had sex with who they had sex with. Um, sometimes that was, you know, very abusive, obviously, when they had sex with their slaves who were not necessarily consensual, but it didn't have the stigma that was put on it, again, by religious dogma. So in the book, the two main protagonists are two women, and one of them is bisexual and the other one is not, but it, it doesn't really get talked about other than the fact that these two women are having a relationship. I actually found it more important that one of them was a patrician and one of them was a plebe soldier. Right. So, that so that's the other thing that I kind of go into is I'm looking at opposites in the book a lot too. So um, I'm looking at class opposites where you have a patrician and a plebeian. I'm looking at um, the specials who are the people who have been genetically engineered to be able to manipulate um the synapses of the brains of others to do various things, uh, electrical, uh, through electrical means. And in any other book, we just call it psychic powers. Right. Right. But I wanted to kind of leave out magic. That was the other thing. I kind of wanted to, to s steer away from magic. There was one part in the book where I was going to go for ghosts and then I went for something completely different. So, um, <laughs> I, I try to stay with a more stoic looking view of the world rather than a supernatural view of the world. I, I think Epictetus would be proud. <laughs> right? Epictetus. I so. Epictetus. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to think, you know, if you had it without, you know, Constantine didn't lo lose, he didn't adopt it. You didn't have the Holy Roman Empire. You didn't have the... Turk and Ottoman Empire as being, you know, enforcing Christianity by the sword. I suppose that means you also have to have Justinian in there too. But I, I like the different direction. I mean, much the way that I, I appreciate the way Harry Turtledove looks backwards. But in the same way, I think that same what if carried forward makes it very, very interesting. Um, taking it to the extreme, maybe we do make it off the planet. I mean, when you start bringing in the Lemurians, and diff how the specials and the aliens all get on together it becomes interesting. Thank you. And I, I actually used the Lemurian uh, as a as a, a, a multifaceted pun. <laughs> there was a, uh, so Lemur lem uh, lemurs are, as you know, you know, marsupial creatures who 
kind of look like a cross between a raccoon and a monkey, right? Mm -hmm. But in ancient Rome, there is a, a, lemurs were like ghosts. And um, there's also a whole, in in the, uh, what do you call it? The Society of Madame Blavatsky and all those people who were really into that kind of thing at the turn of the, you know, 20th century, they had a belief that there was a drowned uh, people called the Lemurians underneath the sea, much like the Atlanteans, Hmm. only they called them the Lemurians. So there's like a multifaceted thing that I was kind of like playing with there. It was like Roman and yet like, uh, you know, new wavy and yet. Appealing to the theosophicals and. Theosophicals. That's what I was. uh, Theosophicals. Yeah. Uh, the the knowers of God, which would be obviously an underground secret sect in your world. Right. Um, My one thing is if, if the Roman empire never collapses, but instead mutates. uh, And I like how you roll in the rest of the world. You never have a dark ages. Okay, good. So you never have a Renaissance that way. And so I have no idea what that means. Well, it means that Gibbons do, you know, rise and fall of practically everybody isn't necessarily true it just changes a little bit i thought well it, there's still the rise and fall of this branch of romandom but the story gets much more interesting because you can trace you know art schools all the way directly back you don't have to rediscover things and if you are not chained by dogma and and the romans were this is where you get to shoot me down the romans were great mongrel accumulators they they, you know oh look the greeks have philosophers let's get us some of those let's get some greek philosophers oh look the the egyptians have great grain growing oh let's get some ship steves and get grain growing well greek Um, is so fashionable and well there's a lot of perks to be said for the persians too because trousers are nice yes trousers are handy trousers are handy (laughs) so how did you go about this when you were first starting? Because this is your first fiction purely out of your fun brain novel. Did you notepad it, outlook it? Did you have scenes in your head? Tell us about your process. So um, I've been writing since I was young uh, and I wrote a lot of bad poetry, of course, because I think everyone does that when they're, you know, a teenager. Especially it's an important you know, phase. Yeah, especially if you were a goth teenager, it was, you know, you had to do that, I think. I started writing kind of vignettes. So I would get these ideas and um, to take, to take it into another realm. I, the way that I produce artwork is that I will get uh, an idea, a concept. And then I, I ask myself, well, how do I want to represent that concept? What, what do I want to do in order to create it so that other people will understand my narrative? And so I think I used the same process with writing uh, only I think it took me, it took me a lot longer (laughs) because I was just writing pieces. And for a long time, I didn't really have the idea that it was all going to be that I was going to put it together. And then I started recrafting them into uh, to fit into a structural outline that I I had created for the story. So um, I think the first thing that I ever wrote was uh, about that, fit into this book was the character Fisk, who is a minor character in the book, but he, um, he was one of the first vignettes that I wrote about. And then um, the rest of the characters just kind of coalesced when the story started unfolding in my brain. And uh, I started like filling in the pieces of the, the skeleton that I had created. So if that makes any sense. <laughs> so it absolutely does. It means that you're you're kind of a cross of not completely organic. You didn't just start writing, but you kind of put up uh, what did Carol Wolf call him? Tent poles. You had tent poles of saying, these are plot points I want, and oh, the characters have clearly revealed themselves to you. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good tent poles. I like that. Did any of them surprise you, the characters, after you started writing in the middle of a scene? They're like, Nope, I'm not gonna go there. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I had to rein in a couple characters. Like I, um, (laughs) the main character, Sean, uh, she, I had to kind of like figure out who exactly she was going to be. And then I figured out that she doesn't know who she is. So that makes sense that I, I'm not exactly clear 
in which direction she's going to go. And I think she surprised me a couple of times about where she went. But in the end, I, I, I think that she's still figuring out who she is and, and going in a, but she's going in a direction at the end of the book. So she was going in a direction in the, in the beginning of the book, and then she got totally sidelined, and then she's going in a direction at the end of the book. So, <laughs> Do you see a sequel in her future? Oh, yeah. I'm already writing it. Um, and uh, I don't know that she will be the main character in it, but I'm definitely writing a sequel to this world because I, I like this world. I find it interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I, I like Xi'an as both kind of – ambitious in one of your peacekeeper series because you know it does make the certain class war interesting and it also it creates room to go in different ideas like who was sean who who's Xian is who is she going to be and that's going to be an interesting process do you think it's going to be a are you have infinite stretching out series or are you thinking nope this is a neat three volume novel what do you what do you got i i don't know i don't <laughs> I mean, I have, there's another novel that's kind of based in a Roman world, uh, but it's a totally, totally different um, idea. And it's actually got magic in it, not magic, but supernatural stuff in it. Hmm. Um, so it, it isn't totally science-y like this world is. So, No, I like that it went science because there's, there's so much that when people think of Roman history, they think of, you know, the magic, the miracles, the things that God's turning into swans trees bulls golden showers of dubious provenance you know <laughs> yeah yeah but you know they but they also had a very practical side to them um and i think i, I think that's what kind of draws me to i mean there's a lot of bad things about romans right i mean you know you look at them and they go these were not nice people overall i mean they basically conquered a lot of people and killed a lot of people and enslaved a lot of people they were horrible in a lot of ways but they had interesting um, they had interesting ways of looking at the world. Like I even find the way that they they the Romans were a superstitious people, um, but I found the the way that they dealt with superstition in their everyday life was different than they dealt with it. I mean, in their public life was different than the way they dealt with it in their private life. And that whole public and private um, has come down. Uh, not just from ancient Rome, but also into modern um, Italian diaspora, because, uh, you know, I was kind of raised with that thing where it's like you, you have a public life, but you have a private life. And these two things aren't always, you know, in, in total line with one another. And um, <laughs> I, I think that could go with world politics today. Right. But in, in America, though, I think that we have this idea that everything should be public. <laughs> and while that's that's great for, uh, you know, full disclosure and everything as a as a human being, I think that puts a lot of pressure on people. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that I, I, I tried to talk about was Sean's problem with her own ambition, like she she disdains her own um, ladder climbing, as she calls it. Um, she doesn't like it, but yet it's a part of her and she can't help it. Right. No, no, it's beautiful. Because we love talking about process, I was going to ask you, what was your editing process like when you, you, you as we all say, we, we have vomited forth a novel now. How, do you, how did you edit it? What was your process to getting it to the, the page that we can all go download on Kindle today? Oh God, I went through that book so many times. I was almost sick of it, honestly. And then I gave it to two trusted friends who um, are good at editing and had them go through it. And then I went through it twice more <laughs> after they had looked at it and went, Oh God, okay. You're totally right about this. I need to change this. This would be so much better if I did this, blah, blah, blah. So um, I did do uh, a lot of editing to, what I had initially considered I was done with and then went back and recrafted it and liked what I did. I mean, like, you know, any, any art piece that I have ever done, I look at it afterwards and go, Oh, well, maybe I should have changed that or I could have done that better. Or, you know, I think everybody does that though, but. Well, I think so. And I, I've also enjoyed reading as I, as I read through different novels, as people go, I think we all get better too. So I hope so. 
<laughs> you're you're not allowed to go look at your first book of nonfiction and say, oh, you know, I don't like the way I really strung that together. It doesn't really move the reader along. I like this one better for that, but oh, now you can get picky. And you got you to gotta just keep writing. You, you, exactly. You, you exactly. Can't, you, you can't. You can't leave us stopped. We need to know more. So in terms of tools, did you just, did you notebook, are you a notebooker or did you, are you a Scrivener girl or a, how, what's your process? So um, initially uh, starting this book long ago and all the vignettes, it was all written by hand. Um, and then I started putting it all together. And then after that, it's all been on, you know, computer. So um do you have a specific have, program you use or do you just whatever word processor you're going to throw it into, you throw it into? Well, I, I used Word and then I um, got the downloaded the uh, template from Amazon to use for their that they that they give you for that. And then I, you know, changed the font and everything to make it pretty like I liked it. But <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm a I'm a PC girl um, when it comes to that. Fair enough, because. It's just so much easier to put it together. And when you were formatting, because we've never really talked about to anybody that's done self-publishing, did you download any formatting templates or how did you first get it and put it all together to put it out in Mobi for Amazon? So uh, Amazon, uh, although I, you know, they are the evil empire at the same time. <laughs> You're writing about Rome for God's sake. I know. It's appropriate right? that they're evil. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I know. Right. So, but they, they provide you a, a pretty good template um, that you can download and then use as um, your template for writing within Word, within Microsoft Word. So that's what I used um, as a template. And then I, um, because, you know, I'm an artist. So, um, and I used to do uh, a lot of <laughs> FDA form filing when I worked in the corporate world. Um, so I did a lot of that kind of formatting and editing, uh, very familiar with that. So I changed the headers and the way they looked and, you know, the way they flowed and that kind of thing a little bit. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I used their template. Cool. And you did the cover yourself, of course, right? Yes. The cover is digital, but I used paint, uh, three of my paintings for the figures in the front uh, that are kind of like in the background. You can kind of see them in the background. And mm -hmm. then the um, the mosaic is taken from a Roman mosaic. No surprise. Um, and then just, you know, a, a nebula. So. It's it's beautiful. And and finally, if it doesn't give too much away, how did you come up with your title? Um, there is a point in the book where someone is actually walking down a hallway and um, she she is walking the mosaic in her hallway. So, and, and it's a crucial moment in the book. So it kind of implies that she is starting upon a path and that she is, you know. It kind of implies a certain bit of artistry too. I am walking casually along art. I guess you could do that down in the uh, Getty exhibits or other places or visit Venice, but that yeah, that, uh, and there are other places you can walk on mosaics at um, other museums. But that I think is a one of the, and this is something wonderful about this book. It has really strong resonant themes, and one of the strong resonant themes is that art is important and f forms your decisions and is something you should pay attention to. And so, uh, having read that scene and, and looked at the book, the echoes of walking a labyrinth versus walking a mosaic and the choices thereof were pretty striking. And that's not the only place at all where art comes into major play in the book, obviously. Well, not obviously. You need to go buy this book and read it, everyone <laughs> listening. You totally do. You totally do. So are you working on the sequel right now? And dare we hope for when it might be released? Oh, I, I, can, I don't know that because I'm not a, a fast writer, but um, I, I think honestly, the side book might come out before the sequel does, which probably not optimum, but the side book is interesting. It's about a woman who, uh, a very beautiful woman who was a courtesan in ancient Rome and uh, starts out like this book does with a murder. Only in this case, um, she's narrating her own murder because she woke up the next morning. 
And uh, it's not a vampire book. Uh, just want to say that right off. But it it does uh, kind of it's, it's kind of more like a Virginia Woolf's Orlando, I guess, where it's it's someone moving through time. But why she's doing it is a totally different reason that only comes out a little bit later. And she is narrating the book. Right. So, yeah, that one's called Soiled Phoenix. Um, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> and that one's probably, uh, I would say, about a third of the way done. Um, but yeah, I just started the sequel. So, I mean, it's brand new. I'm still even figuring out where I'm going with it. So it's going to be a little while. We'll all have to have a writer's retreat somewhere where we can sit and chortle to ourselves and type away. (laughs) That'd be awesome. Totally awesome. Anyway, we fabulous having you here today. Is there anything else that you want to tell new writers? Any advice you have for them? Um, I would say that I didn't consider myself a writer until I started writing and figured out that I loved it. And I think that if you find that you have something interesting to say and are a creative person who thinks of creating of creative ways to express yourself, I think that you should try it. Try writing. Try, try to see if you, if you like it do it. And they make it so easy to, to publish stuff now that it's like, why not do it? You know, why not? Uh, Let me ask for a clarification there. You, you published through Amazon. Is that what you mean by so easy? You found that process simple and easy. Oh, I found it really easy. Oh, okay. Well, good. My my stuff is easy too. So John, we just need to sit you down with uh, somebody and say we can get your stories out there too now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I need, I need to get the book finished, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is an ongoing joke, uh, Christine. So anyway. <laughs> we believe in him. Well, we will put links to all of Christine's amazing art and her stories we mentioned on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if people want to write to you, can they write to you at the CAC at cchianchiart.com? They absolutely can. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate having you. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Langberg. You can hear more from Michael Langberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Eternally Jackal Designs, who helps you all buy cool WDC swag. And hey, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.